Hello, and welcome to Noon Conference hosted by MRI Online. Noon Conference connects the global radiology community through free live educational webinars that are accessible for all and is an opportunity to learn alongside top radiologists from around the world. We encourage you to ask questions and share ideas to help the community learn and grow. You can access the recording of today's conference and previous new conferences by creating a free MRI online account. Today, we're honored to welcome Dr. Suresh Mukherjee for a lecture entitled SCCA of the Larynx, What Radiologists Need to Know. Dr. Mukherjee currently holds academic appointments at numerous institutions and currently serves as the National Director of Head and Neck Radiology at ProScan Imaging and Regional Medical Director at Envision Physician Services. His primary scientific interests have focused on investigating emerging metabolic and physiologic imaging techniques to evaluate head and neck cancer and to differentiate recurrent tumors from post-therapeutic changes. Dr. Mukherjee is a devoted educator and has been an invited speaker on over 500 occasions. We're grateful to him for his support of MRI Online and for serving as our head and neck neuroradiology advisor. At the end of the lecture, please join him in a Q&A session where he'll address questions you may have on today's topic. Please remember to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions so we can get to as many as we can before our time is up. With that, we're ready to begin today's lecture. Dr. Mukherjee, please take it from here. Hey, thanks a lot for, uh, again for having me. Um, and then also, you know, I'll take my glasses off real quick. I just want to thank the audience um, for taking the time to uh, attend this talk. But also thank the Medali people. I think for the people that are joining, you know, I've been working with Medali now for, I think it's, I think four years, four or five years right now. Um, and I can say with full honesty and, and passion and pleasure, they really are just a terrific team. So for those of you that haven't joined Medali yet, I certainly would encourage you because I think it is now, I think we've eclipsed all other platforms and we are the the largest educational platform in the world right now. And I think it's not only due to the content, but really for the terrific people in the culture and modality. So um, Ashley and everybody else, you know, thanks so much. Um, and like I said, all of you that are joining up, you know, please, please come and check it out. So what I'm going to be doing over the next um, 45 minutes to 50 minutes is I'm going to be talking about anatomy and pathology of the larynx. And I'm specifically going to talk about what the surgeon needs to know, but I can change this to what the radi radiation oncologist needs to know and the medical oncologist needs to know. And again, one of the things I'm really grateful for, for Medali and having these seminars, is that I have a full you know hour with you. And I, as I mentioned, Ashley, I actually did block off uh, time after I get done if we want to have a robust Q&A session. Um, I know we have people from all around the world. I know there's some people maybe in the middle of the night that have logged on live as well, too. And so, you know, if you're going to make the effort to do that, I want to make sure that I make the effort to be available to you. So I think that's one of the, number one, one of the real values of having a true exchange. So if you have any questions at the end of it, you know, don't hesitate to ask. I, I, I blocked off another 25 to 30 minutes. Um, so I'm here for you. The second thing is, you know, you go to a lot of meetings and Basically, a lot of these meetings right now, you are, as lecturers, we're asked to give talks in 15 to 20 minutes. And what I've noticed over the last 30 years that I've been doing this is that in that time, you're pressed just to get through the material. And I think part of the teaching aspect is, has been lost. So that's why I'm really grateful, too, to have this time. So what I really want to be able to do, my real goal for this is I want to make you guys learn it. So whoever's on this talk, if, if you don't understand the anatomy, the larynx, and you don't understand sort of the key elements that you should include your report, it's not on you, it's on me. So, you know, I want to take full responsibility for trying to teach you this stuff. And again, I'm thankful for, for you joining me and also Modality and, and Ashley specifically for, for, all of, for all of our help. So the first thing that we do is that when we talk about laryngeal imaging, at least in the United States, and I think this is mostly around the world, the majority of the laryngeal imaging that we'll do is actually with CT. Now, there are some places that do MR as well. You know, I've always grown up using CT for a couple of reasons. Number one, especially with multi-detector imaging, and I have 64 slice here, that's probably old. You know, you can get up to 320 or um, now with photon counting CT, I mean, it's it, the resolution's incredible. But if the the key thing is, is that because now with multi-detector imaging, it's so quick to acquire the images, 
<clears throat> if I look at 100 cases, if I look at 100 patients with head and neck cancer, especially with laryngeal carcinoma, I know I'm going to have a higher percentage of patients that are not going to have motion artifact if I do CT versus if I did MR. MR gives you exquisite imaging, certainly. But on the other hand, when you are dealing with patients with laryngeal carcinomas, they're oftentimes uh, drinkers, they're smoking too, and they may have emphysema, and they may not be able to lay on their back as long. So that's why I tend to use more CT and MR, and I think that's pretty much reflective of practices around the world. Um, we always have to now acquire in submillimeter thick section. So, you know, I have 0 0.625 here. You know, you can do that to 0 0.5. But I think now with the prevalence and the dissemination of the technology of multi-detector imaging, you really shouldn't be acquiring greater than one millimeter because I think it's just easier to do. Always remember to do the overlaps. In this case, we look at our images about approximately 1.25 millimeters with some overlap, and we'll see obviously why that's important. We always give intravenous contrast, and what I end up doing, what, what I tend to do is to um, see you uh, to give contrast in hand. So I'll give 75 cc's in general in total. We tend to use a loading dose, so we'll give 50 cc's initially in order to to in, in order to give the contrast enough time to seep into the soft tissues and the tumors. Unfortunately, I was late raised in the last century. And so I remember when multi-detector imaging first came out and people were just basically giving contrast and injecting and inadvertently people were getting CT angiographies without even knowing it. So that's why we use this dual phase technique where we give 50 cc's, we wait for about 90 seconds. That allows the contrast to go into the soft tissues. And then we give another 25 or 30 cc's and then we acquire. So that's what we mean by the dual phase technique. And one of the biggest pitfalls that, that I've seen um, in laryngeal imaging is, is it's just better to do the CTs in quiet respiration. When we start looking at early phase laryngeal carcinomas, you'll see why, because if you just do it in quiet respiration, I think you can see my hands, the vocal cords separate. But oftentimes what I see is that the technologists are asking the patients to hold their breath. And if you do, the, do that, it closes the vocal cords so you really can't see the vocal folds. So the reason why that started is, again, this is back in the old days when I was a resident, we would do, and as a fellow, is that it took us about 30 seconds to do a single, single acquisition for one slice. And so as a result, the patients would, would move if we, if we didn't tell them specifically to hold their breath, because if they just breathe normally, that would result in motion artifacts. So that's why we, it was, we would say, hold your breath so it wouldn't move. Unfortunately, now we don't need to do that. And if you do hold your breath, you're, you are unable to see lesions involving the medial portions of the true vocal cords. So please, please, please just do your CT scans in quiet respiration. Please don't do them with some type of breath hold because you do, you're just not going to see, you know, all, all of the all of that anatomy and the spread patterns. So when we <clears throat> excuse me, when we look at the larynx, the larynx is actually divided into three areas. And we're going to go over this in, in detail, like I said, just because you know we have some time to do it. So the larynx is divided into a supraglottic larynx, and the glottic is the other term for true vocal cords. Then we have a glottic larynx, which is the true vocal cords. And then we have this area that's below the true vocal cords, which is the subglottic larynx. When we talk about the supraglottic larynx, and again, that larynx is going to be above the true vocal cords, there are four primary components of the supraglottic larynx. And we're going to go over this in detail, so don't worry at all. You've got the epiglottis, which is its anterior midline structure. Then you have a fold of tissue that is running from the arytenoid cartilages to the epiglottis. This is the epiglottic fold. Then we have the false vocal cord, and then we have the laryngeal ventricle. So these are the four components of the supraglottic larynx. And like I said, you know, just, just don't worry about it. We're, we're going to go over all of this. Now, I remember back when I was, again, I, I always talk, because I'm old enough to say this right now, I back I remember back when I was a resident and a, and, and a fellow, and I did a two-year neuro fellowship, and my focus obviously was on head and neck. And I remember uh, my first year, I sort of learned temple bone, but even when I started the second year, I was completely confused on the larynx. I just could not get it. 
Because as soon as I would start talking about the larynx, I had all these multisyllabic terms like hyoepiglottic membrane, areopiglottic fold, thyrohyoid membrane, cricothyroid ligament, thyroretinoid muscle. And the next thing I knew, I was just completely lost in the word salad. It was incredibly confusing to me. So I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but at some point, you know, my little 20 or 30 watt light bulb went off and I realized, hey, um, all of these multisyllabic terms, they're really based on the five primary components of the larynx. And when I mean the primary components, I mean what I kind of referred to as the big five. So I don't know if you've ever been on a safari, but, you know, basically on every safari has the big five animals. So you've got an elephant, a lion, a rhino, a water buffalo, and a, and a cheetah. They're easily recognizable. And so if you sort of take that same concept and, and you look at the larynx, you realize there are really only five main components of that larynx. And so what I mean by this is what I did is I spent th the next two weeks just memorizing the five main scaffolding, the five main components of the larynx. So you've got the hyoid bone here. Then you've got this cartilage right here, which is the thyroid cartilage. So what do you call the membrane that runs from the thyroid cartilage to the hyoid bone? Well, that's the thyrohyoid membrane. Then you've got this little structure right here, which is the epiglottis. The epiglottis is anterior and midline. So what do you call this ligament that goes from the hyoid bone to the epiglottis? Well, it's a hyoepiglottic hyo ligament. That's a, that's a bunch of syllables. I can't even count that. I, I need an AI algorithm for that. So if you go down here, you look at this cartilage, which is the arytenoid cartilage. And then if you go down below it, you have the cricoid cartilage. So what do you call this junction between the cricoid and the arytenoid cartilage? Well, that's the cricoarytenoid joint. If you, there's a muscle that goes from the thyroid cartilage that goes to the arytenoid cartilage, what do you call that muscle? Thyroarytenoid muscle. If you look real closely, there's a little ligament light right here that goes from the thyroid cartilage to the epiglottis. Well, what do you call that ligament? That's the thyroepiglottic ligament. So again, now we're getting to about 10 or 12 syllables. Here's a ligament right here that runs from the cricoid cartilage to the thyroid cartilage. What do you call this ligament? Well, that's just the cricothyroid ligament. So you see where I'm going with this. All of these different ligaments and all of the different muscles derive their name from these five primary components. So once I kind of realized that, what I ended up doing, and I would encourage you to do this too, is just for the next two weeks, just before you go to bed, you know, um, you know, just look at an image like this and just say, what are those five things? Well, I've got the hyoid, I've got the thyroid, I've got the epiglottis, I've got the cricoid, and I've got the arytenoid. All of a sudden, the big five right here, I would argue, is going to be as recognizable as the big five that you'd see on your safari. Now, if you look real close, just for grins, so this is the arytenoid cartilage, and there's a little tiny cartilage right here. This is my favorite cartilage of the whole body. You know, because when I look at that, if you look at it, it sort of looks like this. It sort of looks like the Harry Potter sorting hat. So I was just down at Universal Studio, Studios the other day, and I was able to go to the Harry Potter exhibit. And I'm like, yeah, that just looks like that sorting hat. So if you want to learn a six little cartilage right here, just for grins, that's called the corniculate cartilage. And if you've ever watched Harry Potter, you can always remember it now because of that little sorting hat. So as I mentioned before, when you are starting to look at the uh, larynx, always do an axial images and always do the sagittal and the coronal images. And, you know, I've got to admit, I trained in the days of axial images. I, I don't find these as helpful probably as I should just because I spent the first 25 years of my life doing my own uh, reconstructions in my own brain. But certainly it is routine right now and essential that you always reconstruct your laryngeal images into sagittal and coronal planes. And I know I, I sometimes read out with people uh, globally, and uh, sometimes that's not done routinely. So if you're not doing them, you know, please talk to your technologist because they really can be done instantaneously. So the next thing that we'll talk about is that when we talk about the, the larynx, and especially laryngeal tumors, 
they really have a very nonspecific appearance to this. So for instance, this is an example of squamous cell carcinoma involving the larynx. And this is at the level of the false vocal cords. And we'll come back to this, but if you see the tip of the arytenoids, it's the false vocal cords. Now, don't worry about that. I'm just introducing it now as a radiological landmark, but we'll come back to that. But the point is that this is squamous cell carcinoma. Here's an example of another tumor involving the larynx. It looks very, very much like the squamous cell. This was actually minor salivary gland carcinoma. And this example was actually tuberculosis. So the first point that I want to make is that the majority of the tumors and even the majority of the pathology that you'll end up seeing in the larynx is oftentimes nonspecific. Now, this talk is primarily going to be focused on neoplasms. Maybe one day in the future, we can cover all the pathology uh, in the larynx. But right now, we're going to focus on neoplasms. But the point that I want to make is, is that the neoplasms have a really nonspecific appearance to it. And the concept that I want to drill home is that, as many of you know, um, you know, I see patients in clinic every Wednesday afternoon. So yesterday, I was actually in ENT clinic for three to four hours uh, examining the patients, watching their endoscopies, and going over their images. And it really drills home the point that when you are looking at lesions involving the larynx, the surgeons are easily going to be able to take an endoscope down here. So yes, you can sort of give the standard differential diagnosis, but the fact of the matter is they can see this, they can biopsy, it goes to the pathologist. As we'll see later, our main goal is not necessarily to give a laundry list, it's really to help identify spread patterns. And again, we'll talk about that later. Occasionally, you can make specific diagnosis. This is an enhancing mass involving the lateral aspect of the subglottic larynx. This was a little subglottic hemangioma, thanks to Varsha Joshi. She's now, I think, president of Indian Society of Head and Neck Radiology. She was my uh, fellow many years ago. Um, thank you for her for this example. Here's an example of a densely enhancing mass involving the true vocal cords. You can see the tubular enhancement, very similar to the artery in the vein. This was an arterial venous malformation. And in this case, this was a lesion arising from the cricoid cartilage. This is one of the more common lesions that arise from the cartilages to involve the larynx. And this, in fact, was a chondrosarcoma. So based on this, occasionally you can come up with a specific histologic diagnosis. But the point is, is that these tend to be um, very, very rare. Oh, excuse me, very rare. And it's not, it's not common. So let's talk about the normal anatomy of the larynx. So what we're going to do is that we're going to start with the superglottic larynx, and we're first going to talk about the epiglottis. So this is where we're going to go to that, that, that wonderful anatomy. <clears throat> so what you see here is a sagittal image right here involving the, the, the larynx, and this line tells you exactly where we are. So we have this red line right here, and it's going through the larynx. And if we look anteriorly, this is what our surgeons see endoscopically. So the epiglottis, remember, is an anterior midline structure. So when you perform endoscopy, you can see that epiglottis anteriorly. So we know the epiglottis is anterior midline. So when we perform a CT or an MR, in this case, it's an MR, the epiglottis is located anterior midline. Those are our radiological landmarks. If you look anteriorly, we can see these two little air pockets. This is one of the V's. The V's can be confusing in the larynx. This is actually the vollecula. So the vollecula are these little air bags or these little saccules, sacs that are located at the superior portion of the larynx. And this little fold right here is called the median glossoepiglottic fold. So this actually attaches to the back of the tongue base. So we're sort of in this area right here, this is where that, that's this specific image is. So here's our vollecula. There's one vollecula, there's two vollecula, there's our meeting glossoepiglottic fold. But the key thing here is that epiglottis is midline. Now, here's an example of a tumor that's involving the epiglottis. It's located anterior and midline. So this is what we see at endoscopy. And this is what we see on a CT scan. So how do we know that this is involving the epiglottis? Because again, excuse me, it's anterior and midline. Remember, the anatomy is constant. So very important you understand this because now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the next location of the supraglottic larynx. So this is called the airy epiglottic fold. So remember when I showed the arytenoid cartilages, the arytenoid cartilages were, were paired cartilages that were off the midline. 
So what do you call this fold of tissue that runs from the arytenoid cartilage all the way up to the epiglottis? Well, those are the airy epiglottic folds. So this was our epiglottis here anteriorly, and this fold of tissue, <clears throat> excuse me, located right here on the right and on the left, these are the airy epiglottic folds. So the airy epiglottic folds are paired midline structures. So when we look at this, not, uh, this T1 weighted MR right here, this is one airy epiglottic fold on the right. Here's the other airy epiglottic fold on the left. This is our epiglottis that's anterior and midline. This is an exophytic tumor involving the right airy epiglottic fold. This is what our surgeons would see at endoscopy. And this is what we see radiologically. This is an airy epiglottic fold carcinoma. Now, one of the biggest questions I always get was, you know, I look at this and sometimes I see this asymmetry in the airy epiglottic folds. And if you have looked at it enough neck CT, sometimes, as you know, paralyzed vocal cords can give you a thickened right airy epiglottic fold. So the question comes up and, and you're like, well, how do I know that this is actually a tumor versus a paralyzed cord? And the way that I do it is the following. So first of all, both a paralyzed cord and a tumor can result in, if you will, asymmetrical thickening of the airy epiglottic fold. But if you look at this area right here, this is the piriform sinus on the right side, and this is the piriform sinus on the left side. The classic paramidline cord of a paralyzed cord is going to result in ipsilateral dilatation of the ipsilateral piriform sinus. But if you have a tumor, then that's going to result in narrowing of the right piriform sinus. So in this case, if you look at this and you're a little confused, you know, look at that piriform sinus. I mean, if you see that narrowed, that raises your suspicion that you actually may be dealing with a tumor. Regardless, if you it, it, it is completely OK if you're not sure and you're looking at the CTs and you see this thickening right here. It's completely appropriate to recommend an endoscopy if there's any question at all, because again, you're not going to be able to see mucosal tumors. But the point here is that just remember, this is the normal airy epiglottic fold because it's pyramid line. This airy epiglottic fold is shows a mass and the resulting narrowing of the piriform sinus all put together indicate a primary site involving the right airy epiglottic fold. Now, I just mentioned the airy epiglottic fold here on the right and on the left. Now, the piriform sinus is not part of the larynx, but I did want to mention this here because the airy epiglottic fold is here. And I mentioned in the last slide is that this space right here, just lateral to the airy epiglottic fold, is the piriform sinus. So if I go back again before, here's one piriform sinus, there's the other piriform sinus. And the piriform sinus is technically part of the hypopharynx, and piriform sinus gets its name from a pear-shaped. So when you actually look at a pear, you know, normally this is the great part of the pear. It's nice and juicy and chunky. You know, I like a nice, ripe pear, right? So this is where you love to bite into. Well, when you look at the piriform sinus, the entrance of this piriform sinus is the big, chunky part of the pear. And as you get lower and lower into the piriform sinus, it reaches an apex of the piriform sinus. So when you are looking at your endoscopy, here's the epiglottis here. Here's the area epiglottic fold on the right. Here's the area epiglottic fold on the left. And this is the opening or the introitus of the piriform sinus. So when we look at this uh, PET MRI scan, there's one piriform sinus here on the right, and there's another piriform sinus here on the left. So this is the mid portion of the pear. And then when you get to the bottom of the pear, the apex, well, lo and behold, here's the apex of the piriform sinus. And as you can see, it's at the level of the cricoarytenoid joint. And we'll talk about this later, but the point is, is that just realize this apex of the pear is right here. So this is not part of the larynx, it's part of the hypopharynx, but it's in very close ap uh, proximity to the larynx. So this is the normal area epiglottic fold on the left side. <laughs> this is the piriform sinus, and here we have a tumor that's involving the piriform sinus. There's a little bit of thickening here of the area epiglottic fold, but notice how the majority of this is in the piriform sinus, and this just happens to be a, pe a PET CT demonstrating abnormal uptake in that piriform sinus. So now we'll get back to the main components of the larynx, and technically this is conceptually for me the hardest one to identify. This is referred to as the false vocal cord. 
So there's a false vocal cord and there's a true vocal cord. So what exactly is the false vocal cord? Well, if I go back one slide, a false vocal cord is this little fold of tissue that's located just above the true vocal cord. So this is the airy epiglottic fold, and this fold of tissue right here is the false vocal cord. The posterior portion of the false vocal cord attaches to the top of the arytenoid cartilage. So the false vocal cord attaches to the top of the arytenoid cartilage. So when we talk about radiological landmarks, where is the false vocal cord? The false vocal cord is attaching to the top of the arytenoid cartilage. And if you will, the false vocal cord is basically the inferior reflection of the area epiglottic fold. So when I look at this non-contrast T1-weighted MR, what tells me we're at the false vocal cord? Well, you can see the top of one arytenoid cartilage here and the top of the other arytenoid cartilage here. That's our radiological landmark. And this is an example of a false vocal cord tumor. Here's the tumor right here. It's actually involved in the opposite side as well. But notice the yellow arrow right here points at the cartilage that is just the arytenoid cartilage. So when we see this, we know we're at the false vocal cord. So on this coronal image, here's a coronal image of the airway. This red line tells us where we are. So this is where we are here. This is where we are here. When we were looking at the larynx, notice the top of the arytenoid cartilage. And then right below it is the laryngeal ventricle. This is the other V. You have a volecula and you have a ventricle. So it can be confused. Remember the volecula are the little saddlebags up at the top of the larynx. The ventricles separate the false vocal cord from the true vocal cord. So if the way I look at it, it kind of looks like a Yoda to me. I hope you like the Yoda here, but that's just the way I think. So there's this air right here. Look at the Yoda and look at the ears. So when I look at the Yoda here, the false vocal cord is basically going to be at the top of the ears. And then the ears are basically going to be the air in the laryngeal ventricle. So... If we go from the false cord, now we jump across the laryngeal ventricle, and now we're at the true cord. Then look what happened to the ears. Now we're below the ears of the Yoda. So we jumped from the false vocal cord to the laryngeal ventricle to the, to the true vocal cord. And on this anatomic illustration, now we're at the level of the cricoarytenoid joint. So I'll just go back one. There's a false vocal cord. Notice the top of the arytenoid cartilage. Look where this line goes. Now we're at the cricoarytenoid joint. How do we know we're at the true vocal cords? Because of the cricoarytenoid joint, there's a cricoid cartilage here. Here's the arytenoid cartilage. That's our joint. If I go back one, that's the arytenoid cartilage only. Now the cricoarytenoid joint tells us we're at the true vocal cord. And here's a little illustration of a true vocal cord carcinoma. So when I look at the CT scan, this tells me that there's a tumor right here. The yellow arrow shows it. Here's the cricoid cartilage. Here's the arytenoid cartilage. And I don't know, the way that I remember this is I think of a little smiley face. You know, back when I grew up in the last century, we used to have a circle <laughs> that had a smiley face on it. Now we're all fancy. We call these emojis. But if you remember the smiling emoji right here, see this little smiling face? The cricoid cartilage is smiling at you. The lips are sort of turned in. But if you can remember this smiley face right here and remember the cricoarytenoid joint, you'll always remember the radiological landmarks for the true vocal cord. And then the last bit of anatomy, so what have we done so far, just to level set? So far, what we've done is we've talked about the anatomy of the supraglottic larynx. So that was the epiglottis, the airy epiglottic fold, the false focal cord, and the laryngeal ventricle. That was the supraglottic larynx. Now we're going to talk about the cricoarytenoid joint. That tells us where the true vocal cords are located. And now what we're going to do, supraglottic, glottic, and now we're going to talk about the subglottic larynx. So the subglottic larynx is pretty, it's pretty simple. What the subglottic larynx is, is that part of the larynx that is defined by the cricoid cartilage. Remember the cricoid cartilage, right? That was the one big cartilage that basically forms the foundation of the larynx. It's one of the big five. So this is an example here of a tumor involving the subglottic larynx, and you can see it's involved, it's within this component of the cricoid cartilage. On the coronal images, this was the airy epiglottic fold, this was the false vocal cord, 
This is the laryngeal ventricle. This is the true vocal cord. And here we can see the shoulders in the beginning of the subglottic larynx. And with a leap of faith, you can actually see one cricoid cartilage on the left and the other, there's the ring, if you will, and that defines the subglottic larynx. <clears throat> so how do we identify the subglottic larynx? Well, we look for the ring of the cricoid cartilage. Now, the mucosa around the cricoid cartilage is very, very thin. So when I look at this, I think of this surprise emoji. So unlike this emoji right here, which is sort of smiling, because that gives us the cricoarytenoid joint, when I see the surprised emoji and I see all of this air right here that's packed adjacent to the cricoid cartilage, then I know I'm at the level of the subglottic larynx. So that's how I remember that. And this is an example here of a tumor that's involved in the subglottic larynx, and you can see it's narrowing this. Now, these patients oftentimes present with strider. If you're looking at a child, the classic subglottic pathology that would present with strider was crook, right? Because it would narrow the subglottic larynx. In, a, in, a, in an adult, the cricoid cartilage is well-formed, and these patients that have primary subglottic carcinomas oftentimes present with difficulty breathing, and they can be striderous, and that's because of the narrowing of the airway. So what we've done so far is that we talked about the normal anatomy of the larynx, and we just spent a good 20 minutes going over the gory detail of the larynx. So I want all of you all to remember the larynx. And if you don't, you know, go back to the Modality website, you know, listen to this talk, and, and you know, we've got plenty of time to understand the larynx. Now, the next thing and how I'm going to end this talk is really talk about the real value of imaging. So as I mentioned before, the majority of the pathology that can be seen in the larynx can be visualized by direct endoscopy. So really, you know, when you get into the higher levels of head and neck radiology, it's more than normal versus abnormal. It's more than basically listing five or 10 things that you may see on your imaging study, but it's actually trying to identify spread patterns and staging because that's where the real value of imaging comes in. So this was a, an older slide, and I still like to show it just because it makes a really, really important point, is that if you have early stage lesions like a T1 lesion, these are typically treated with conventional radiation therapy. But as you go from T1 to T4 higher stage diseases, you can see that the options for treatment are total laryngectomy with or without radiation therapy, radiation therapy and chemotherapy or a combination of, of chemo, radiation, and surgery. So the point is, is as the stage gets worse, the treatment options become much more aggressive. And the challenge is, and I've seen this before when I'm in clinic, is that you'll have these patients right here that are presenting with these masses, these masses involving the larynx. And this was an endoscopic view. Now, when the patient is actually in the clinic and you perform your endoscopy, well, look here, this is the airway. If you've ever tried, and I haven't tried this because I, I just watch, I don't do the endoscopies, but if I try to put a tube deep to this and try to figure out the full extent of the disease, I could occlude the airway and the patient could just crash right there in the clinic itself. So, my point is, is that there are a lot of things that we provide on radiology that cannot be seen clinically that directly affect how these patients are staged and how they'll be and then how and how they'll be treated. Now, I'm not a big fan of standardized reports. You know, I think <clears throat> I don't know what a standardized report is. I'll ask 10 people what a standardized report is and I'll get 10 different answers. So I'm not advocating a standardized report. The term that I like to use is key elements. So when we are evaluating patients with laryngeal carcinoma, you know, I will give my residents and my fellows and my, you know, my colleagues full freedom to put what you want in, you know, your, your, discussion, your, your observations, your, your summaries, and so on and so forth. But what I would ask you to do somewhere is to comment on these key elements, because these key elements, subglottic spread, exolaryngeal spread, cartilage invasion, transglottic spread, and, and involvement of the anterior commissure, if you comment on these five things, you will directly affect staging in many, many cases. And oftentimes you won't even affect staging, but you'll affect how these patients are specifically treated. 
So what I want to do in the remaining time is talk about these five key elements and how you can assess this if you understand the anatomy that we just reviewed. So the first key element is whether or not there's subglottic spread. Well, what's subglottic spread? Well, subglottic spread is just a tumor that it spreads inferiorly to involve the subglottic larynx. So again, to understand this, we have to understand the anatomy. So here's an example of a cancer that's involving the true vocal cord. Here's the cricoid cartilage, here's the arytenoid cartilage, and we can see this tumor right here involving the right true vocal cord, and it's extending right here to the anterior commissure. So here's the anterior commissure. We'll talk about that later. This back here is the posterior commissure. So here we have a tumor involving the right true vocal cord. When we look more inferiorly, notice we're not at the cricoarytenoid joint, and now we're starting to see the back of the cricoid cartilage. So now we're actually at the subglottic level. No arytenoid cartilage, so I know we're at the top of the subglottic larynx. And when we see this, we can see tumor that's located right here. So this is an example of subglottic spread. The tumor is involved in the true vocal cord, but it spreads inferiorly to the level of the subglottis. Another example here, a right true vocal cord carcinoma. Look at the O right here. This is that surprise emoji that we just talked about. And the yellow arrow right here points at this tumor involving the subglottic larynx. So we have to ask ourselves, there's subglottic spread, but we have to ask that question, who cares? You know, why does it make a difference? Well, it makes a difference for the following is that if we as the radiologists say there's greater than six millimeters of subglottic spread, at most institutions, if the patients wish to be treated with surgery, they'll have to undergo a total laryngectomy. Think of that, a total laryngectomy, just based on what we see. Because at endoscopy, especially in the clinic, it's really, really hard to look at that subglottic spread by performing an endoscope. They have to take the patient to the operating room. They have to do a rigid examination. And this type of assessment by us in the clinic, because now if we say this, these patients may not want to go total laryngectomy, but oftentimes they're treated with chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So although this doesn't necessarily affect staging, it does definitely tell them that these patients are, are probably going to have to be treated with chemo and radiation if they want to have some native preservation of their voice and um, their swallowing. So the next key element is transglottic spread. So what exactly is transglottic spread? Well, transglottic spread is when a tumor crosses the laryngeal ventricle. So, you know, I think they're on the call today. I, I have the privilege of reading out with the folks in Tanzania as, as part of, at Muhas, as part of uh, part of my R, the RSNA Visiting Professors Program. We've been doing it now for almost two years. It's really, really a joy. And I remember I first told them that this is the definition of transglottic spread. And actually, one of them said to me, well, Dr. Mukherjee, you know, why is it transglottic? Why is it, shouldn't it be called transventricular spread? And they're actually right. It's 100% right. So it's, we call it transglottic spread, but functionally is when this tumor crosses over the laryngeal ventricle. So it's really crossing the ventricle. So how does this work? Well, you have a tumor right here involving the supraglottic larynx. In this case, notice how the inferior portion of this tumor is above the level of the false vocal. But in this case, notice how the inferior portion of the tumor <clears throat> crosses the false vocal cord, it crosses the laryngeal ventricle, and it crosses the true vocal cord. So this is transglottic, i.e. transventricular spread. So why does that make a difference? Well, it makes a difference in the surgical options. So here's a tumor involving the larynx. So let's, let's, let's do what we learned about. So this, where is this tumor? It's located anterior and midline. So of course it's in the supraglottis, but let's take it to the next level. It's involving the epiglottis. Why? Because it's anterior and midline. So this tumor is extending into the pre-epiglottic space. Now, where was this CT scan obtained? Well, here's the cricoid cartilage. There's the arytenoid cartilage. This is the cricoarytenoid joint. Notice how there's no tumor here. So in this case, there's no transglottic spread. So these patients potentially could be treated with a supraglottic laryngectomy where they resect the epiglottis, the area epiglottic folds, and the false vocal cords. 
But what about in this case? Well, this was a case I saw 30 years ago. Sometimes I like to show these old cases because there's a nice story behind it. This was a case, again, anterior and midline. It's an epiglottic carcinoma. I remember the surgeon said to me, well, I think that this, this tumor ends above the true vocal cords and I can resect this with a supraglottic laryngectomy, you know, perform this type of surgery. But on the other hand, when I looked at the true vocal cords, I can see the cricoid cartilage, I can see the arytenoid cartilage, and lo and behold, there was tumor right here at the true vocal cords. And I remember I said to the surgeon at the time, when we looked at the CT, I said, you know, Dr. So-and-so, I don't think that you're going to be able to do a superglottic. The tumor is involved in the right true vocal cord. And, you know, and he argued with me and said, well, you're just a radiologist. You can't see this. Well, he came back next week and said, ah, you were right. They ended up had, uh, took the patient to the operating room. You know, they found this tumor involved in the true vocal cord. It had crossed the laryngeal ventricle. So they were not able to do a supraglottic laryngectomy. And in this particular case, the only surgical option was a total laryngectomy. So because we told them this, these patients were treated with chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So in these cases, not only do we affect the type of surgery, but because chemo and radiation is an accepted treatment now for laryngeal carcinomas, we actually directly affect how these patients are treated. Another example here, you can also have transglottic carcinoma start from the true vocal cord and work its way up. So before we were up here and it came down, now we're down here at the true cord, and these things can extend superiorly. So here's an example of a patient that has a true vocal cord carcinoma. Where are we right now? There's a cricoid cartilage. There's the arytenoid cartilage. It's smiling at us, right? That's a true vocal cord carcinoma. Where are we at now? Well, we see one arytenoid cartilage, the other arytenoid cartilage, and notice how the paraglottic fat or the paralaryngeal fat and the little bit of laryngeal ventricle here, they look symmetric. So there's no tumor at this level. So this tumor is isolated to the true vocal cords, and they could perform this type of procedure, which is a hemilaryngectomy. But here's another example. Here's a tumor involving the right true vocal cord. And where are we now? See this little top of the arytenoid cartilage right here? This little muscle right here is a lateral thyroarytenoid muscle. See the tiger stripes here? You can see dark, you can see black, you can see dark, you can see black. These are the nice stripes on the left. And on the right-hand side, we can see tumor here involving the right paralaryngeal space. So this is an example of transglottic spread. Why is it important? Because the surgeons cannot perform now this hemilaryngectomy. So I know in my practices, if I see this, the patients are oftentimes not treated with surgery, but again, in order to preserve native function, these patients are oftentimes treated with chemotherapy and radiation therapy purely because of the spread that we detect. And oftentimes the spread is submucosal. They cannot see that on their clinical imaging. Well, transglottic spread was the hardest one to identify. That was conceptually the hardest. The other ones are, are much more straightforward. So a T4 lesion is exolaryngeal spread. These are just kind of a straightforward examples of tumors that are involving the larynx that spread into the soft tissues. I think we can all make this diagnosis, but just realize exolaryngeal spread is T4. But on the other hand, these folks are obvious. You know, what we want to do is look for that early exolaryngeal spread. So earlier I showed you a case of piriform sinus carcinomas. The piriform sinus carcinoma is lateral. It's the piriform sinus is located very laterally. And sometimes these tumors can extend into the soft tissues of the neck, oftentimes through this little opening right here for the superior laryngeal artery and nerve. And if you look real closely, notice how this piriform sinus cancer has grown out into the space. So here's a piriform sinus carcinoma on the right-hand side. Here's the normal vessels right here. And look how the left-hand side, we can see the tumor right here is abutting these vessels and displacing these vessels. So this is an early example of exolaryngeal spread that cannot be seen clinically but what we see radiologically and upstages these tumors to a T4. So that's early example of exolaryngeal spread. The next key element for the larynx is cartilage invasion. 
So the interesting thing about cartilage invasion is many of you know, I've been um, one of the radiologists on the staging system since the fifth edition, and we're already to the eighth edition. Over time, what we've done is that a T3 lesion is defined as erosion of the inner cortex, and a T4 lesion is defined by erosion of the outer cortex of the thyroid cartilage. So this is T3 and this is T4. In the old days, we would just wait for the larynx to come back and the pathologist would end up making the diagnosis. And they would tell us where there was erosion of the inner cortex or the outer cortex. That's where this came from. What's happened over the last you know, 10 years or so, 15 years or so, is because it's been accepted that larynx cancers can be treated with chemotherapy and radiation therapy. As I've showed before, these upfront decisions are made on base, based on what we say on imaging. So I always like to say, you know, we, in a way, radiologists, in a way, are in a way at times the new pathologist of the new millennium. That because of the acceptance of, of imaging to detect erosion of the inner and the outer cortex, this is now being used to triage patients. So here's an example of a tumor involving the larynx. This is involving the anterior commissure. And this is an example of a T3 lesion. Notice the red arrow points at erosion of the inner cortex and the outer cortex is maintained. But here's an example of a T4 lesion. Notice how the erosion of the inner cortex and the outer cortex are both eroded. Now, I often get asked, and I said, well, how do you, what do you do about these areas here? Notice how there's absence of the cartilage. Well, what I always do, at least in my practice, I draw a line down the middle and I compare one side to the other side. Every one of us has ossification of the thyroid cartilage, but each, each of us ossifies a little bit differently. But in general, the ossification tends to be symmetric. So in this particular patient on the uninvolved side, I can see right here, this lamina, the thyroid cartilage, I can see no uh, ossification and I see ossification. So if th this area right here, I'm not very confident that there's cartilage erosion, but on the left-hand side, because that lamina is actually present, on the right-hand side, the absence of this tells me that there's a high likelihood of cartilage invasion because in this patient, the contralateral side was ossified. So because this tumor is on the patient's right side, this absence gives me a high degree of confidence that there's cartilage erosion. We can also look for cartilage erosion based on MR. So either one of these is fine. There's a lot of great work that was done, especially dating back to the, the 1990s. And so you can perform MR, it's fine. What you end up doing is that on the non-contrast T1, this patient had a right-sided thyroid uh, a laryngeal carcinoma, the true vocal cord. What we do is we look for absence of the fat in the right thyroid cartilage. So notice the normal high signal thyroid cartilage on the left, it's truncated on the right. So this is evidence of cartilage evasion on uh, cartilage erosion on MR. You can also look for increased T2 signal or gadolinium enhancement. All of these have been proven to be suggestive of cartilage erosion, but in general, this is probably the one that I most relied on. It's the absence of fat involving the thyroid cartilage, and this is just the pathologic correlation. I want to thank uh, Supreeta Arya from India for giving me this nice example. And then the last thing that we'll talk about is anterior commissure. So, so far, the key elements are subglottic spread transglottic, exolaryngeal spread, cartilage invasion, and we will end with the anterior commissure. <laughs> so what is the anterior commissure? Well, the muscle that runs from the thyroid cartilage to the arytenoid cartilage is called the thyroarytenoid muscle. That is the vocalis muscle. The most medial component of this is referred to as the vocalis ligament. Now, this ligament attaches right here to the inner perichondrium of the thyroid cartilage. There are three components or three little ligaments here, or three components that form this ligament that's referred to as Boyle's ligament. So you have the ligament right here that runs from the thyroid cartilage to the tip of the epiglottis. This is the thyroepiglottic ligament. The second component is that ligament that I just talked about. This is the vocalis ligament. This is the medial thickening, the ligamentous portion of the thyroarytenoid muscle, and that's the vocalis ligament. And the third component is the inner perichondria. 
So all of these three components form this thick area right here, which is referred to as Broyles ligament, and it's located at the anterior most aspect of the larynx at the level of the true vocal cord, and this is what's referred to as the anterior commissure. So what ends up happening is the following, <clears throat> is that if you have a patient that has a true vocal cord carcinoma and it really extends anteriorly, what are the surgical options? Well, from a surgical standpoint, they're thinking, hey, do I need to perform a total laryngectomy? Or is it possible I could do some type of laser resection and to remove that tumor? Or should I treat these patients with chemotherapy and radiation therapy? Those are the decisions that are made. So when you perform an endoscopy, the surgeons can go down and they can end up seeing this. So this yellow arrow points at a tumor involving the anterior commissure. Now, when they see this and they think it's pretty superficial, they may say, hey, this looks pretty good. Maybe I can do a laser resection on this, um, some type of micro dissection, micro laryngectomy. That's great. But what they cannot see is this anterior extension. They cannot see this extension anteriorly, and they oftentimes cannot see this extension to involve the contralateral true cord. It's really important about this anterior extension. Because here's another example here. This was a patient right here that has an anterior commissure carcinoma. This was originally staged as a T1 lesion, but clinically. But when we looked radiologically, look at this right here. This is cartilage erosion right here as this tumor extends anteriorly. So some of these early stage T1 lesions that are not cured by radiation therapy may be more aggressive, but on the other hand, some are due to understaging. So the clinical importance of this is that, number one, this tumor cannot be treated with micro laser resection because of the cartilage erosion. Number two, if we do detect the cartilage erosion, it upstages to a T4. So this patient cannot be treated with radiation therapy alone. The surgical option is going to have to be total laryngectomy at most institutions, and if we see this, all of a sudden, these patients have to have chemotherapy and radiation therapy because it's T4. These are all sophisticated principles. But on the other hand, it all boils down to you. If you understand the anatomy and you understand the cricoarytenoid joint, remember our smiley face right here? You understand the anatomy of the anterior commissure. And now you can understand how you can detect cartilage invasion these are simple concepts, and if you understand the anatomy, you will make a huge difference in how your patients are treated. So what we've done over the last 50 minutes or so is that we went over the anatomy. So remember the anatomy, supraglottic larynx, which is the epiglottis, epiglottic fold, the uh, false vocal cord, and the laryngeal ventricle. We talked to the true vocal cord was a cricoarytenoid joint, and the subglottis was the base of the cricoid cartilage. And then what we did is we talked about the five things. These are the key elements to include in your report. So, you know, please try to comment on subglottic spread, transglottic spread, exolaryngeal spread, cartilage invasion, and anterior commissure. And so what I would ask you to do for the 400 plus people that were on the call today is that for the next two weeks, you know, just before you go to bed, just identify the big five right here, hyoid bone, epiglottis, thyroid cartilage, arytenoid cartilage, and cricoid cartilage. If you just do this just for five minutes a day for the next two weeks, you will understand the big five, and these cartilages will be as recognizable to you as the big five safari animals that we see on your right. So thank you so much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much for your lecture. And yes, we are opening the floor for questions. So if you have any, please place them in that Q&A feature. And Dr. Mukherjee, if you can pop open that Q&A box. Yep. Got it. Awesome. Got yep. quite a few so, in there yeah. already. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no problem. So the first thing you're right, the, the dual phase imaging, I probably didn't do the best on that. The dual phase imaging is uh, where we give a loading bolus. So we give an initial arterial a bolus of about 50 cc's and we wait. So that early, uh, that dual bolus, we wait for about uh, uh, in, uh, two minutes or so. That allows the contrast to go into the soft tissues. And then we give another bolus of about 
25 cc's or so, and then we acquire our images. So that's the dual phase technique. We described that in around 2005. I think now, as you know, in many parts of the body, you know, I think everything outside the head and neck is an accessory organ. I kind of joke about that. But I think if you look, look at the liver and the pancreas and, and, and other organs, you know, dual phase imaging is being used very commonly. So that was the uh, definition for the for the dual phase. So do you want me to read off the questions or do you want to read them to me or how should we do this? Because there's stuff in the Q&A and there's stuff in the in the chat. So um, sure. Happy to read them to you. Hopefully I don't butcher too many of the words. Okay. Um, are, how do you are correct you in asymmetric or, are you in position? Or chat? Are you in Q&A or chat right now? I'm in the Q&A. Okay, perfect. Yeah. How do you correct asymmetric position and differ that from asymmetric thickening on larynx? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the way that I do this, and it's a fabulous question because back when I was, um, you know, back when I was a resident, um, positioning was, it's, it always is really, really important. And I was fortunate where I trained that there was a lot of focus uh, with our technology to make sure the patients were straight in position. Oftentimes what happens, it can be really confusing if the patient's not perfectly aligned in the scanner. But what you can do is that you can acquire the, if you're using a multi-detector imaging and you're acquiring it as a volume metric acquisition, you can just go in and take the line and just do a MPR reconstruction, the axial plane, and then you can align that patient perfectly. And it's a very practical question. I do that every day in my practice because sometimes the text just, you know, they're, they do a great job, but sometimes you'll have that occasional patient where it's kind of hard to do it. So I take that volume data and I do my MPRs and I just kind of tilt it in the um, in the axial plane so I know it's symmetric. How do you visual? How do you see for vocal cord palsy? Yeah. So as I mentioned before, the vocal cord palsy. What I look for is for asymmetrical thickening of the right area epiglottic fold, and if there's thickening and ipsilateral dilatation of the piriform sinus, then I start thinking about vocal cord palsy. So you have to have a paramedian cord. You have to have, oftentimes it's thick, and then the right piriform sinus is ipsilaterally dilated. So those are the three things that I look for. And even when I do see this, I still will recommend an endoscopy to make sure there's not an underlying neoplasm. How do you identify paraglottic spread at glottic level? That is a really, really great question. So um, one thing that I will say is that, um, you know, let me go to this slide. Let me go to the slide. I remember, let's see. Yeah, here's, a, here's probably a good example. Can you see my slide, Ashley? Yes. Okay. So the challenge that, that that I've run into is that back when I was a fellow, and I always say that, but I can say it now because I'm old. And I, I was I was born in the last century, if you will. When we when we did our imaging, you know, 25 years ago, the slice thickness that we used to get was somewhere between anywhere from two millimeters to three millimeters. And when you did the two to three millimeter slices, oftentimes we would sometimes pick off like maybe the base, the false vocal cord and the true vocal cord. And oftentimes you could see the paralaryngeal fat right here. The challenge is, is that now we're doing very, very thin sections and the, the thyroid muscle is pretty thick. It's really hard to actually see the paraglottic space at the level of the true vocal cords. I think it's just really, really hard to see. So I think what we first described 30 years ago, oftentimes we were probably doing a little bit of partial voluming. So I have a hard time seeing the paraglottic space right at the true vocal cords. Now at this level, I'm at the false vocal cord. And at the false vocal cord, then I can see my tiger stripes. I love talking about tiger stripes. So I can see the cartilage here. I can see the black fat. I can see the lateral thyroid muscle, and I can see the fat. So once I get above the true vocal cords, um, the medial thyroid muscle tends to peter out and you can have the little strip of the lateral thyroid muscle. So I think it's easier to see at the level of the false cords as opposed to the true cords. 
All right. If a tumor extends anteriorly through a non-ossified midline defect of the thyroid cartilage without cartilage invasion, would this still be T4? Uh, so let me see now. Um, which one, Leah? I, that's a good question. So which one was that one? That was on the Q and A, right? I want to make Q sure. Q and A, the yeah, question. the one all the way at the top. All the way at the top. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So the question is, is, is a great question. If a tumor extends anteriorly through a non-ossified, oops, I just lost it, a non-ossified cartilage, thyroid cartilage, is it still a T4? So the answer is yes. So the cartilage doesn't have to be ossified. The cartilage before it becomes ossified is cartilaginous. So if the tumor extends through the inner and the outer cortex, even if it's non-ossified, it is still a T4. It is still a T4. What do you prefer for cartilage invasion, MRI or dual energy CT? Um, I like, um, uh, well, you know, there have, there were a couple of papers written a while ago on, on dual energy CT. In fact, I use that in one of my talks, but the dual energy CT is, I don't know how, uh, how reliable it's been shown long-term. So I would rather do, my preference is to do a regular CT uh, with high resolution bone algorithms to look for the cartilage invasion. And then I would go to MR as a problem solving technique. I don't think, um, I don't think the dual energy CT is reliable enough to make a clinical decision as to whether or not someone's gonna be, keep their larynx. Gotcha. This might be related. Uh, why use dual phase IV contrast injection technique? Yeah. So the reason is, is to make sure that you have enough time for the contrast to infiltrate the tumor in the soft tissues. Because if you, if you inject and then acquire, you're going to be doing CTAs on everyone. So when you do a CT the neck, what you want to do is optimize the contrast going into the tumor and the soft tissues. And you also want to make sure that when you're looking at your neck CTs, and this is a good example here, you have a pacification of your arteries and you have a pacification of your veins. So the dual phase allows you to do both of those. What role does the, the diffusion sequence play? Um, I think diffusion sequence in the larynx can be a little challenging because there's so much motion. What The way that I use diffusion um, is that if I see a mass in the head and neck, I, re I always rely on the location and the normal appearance on the standard sequences to help me determine whether it's benign or malignant. But if there's something I'm not sure about, then I turn to the diffusion. Now, some people have used diffusion to differentiate between post-treatment changes and recurrence. Um, I think that's good, so long as your technique is good, so long as there's no motion. And then the mass that you're looking at is you know, probably greater than a centimeter, because the smaller the mass, the harder it is to reliably see on diffusion sequences. Thank you. What is the big five? again? Uh, so the big five are the epiglottis, the thyroid cartilage, the arytenoid cartilages, the false folk, uh, excuse me, <laughs> actually, hold on for a second. Let me just go back to my, let me go back so I don't mess it up. So here's the big five right here. You ready? So the big five for the larynx are going to be the hyoid bone, the epiglottis, the thyroid cartilage, the arytenoid cartilage, and the cricoid cartilage. Those are the big five of the larynx. Thank you. What comprises the posterior commissure of the larynx? Yeah, great question. So uh, terrific questions, by the way. Um, yeah, keep them coming. So the, the posterior commissure is the posterior portion of the larynx that's located between both the arytenoid cartilages. So when I show when I show this image right here, can you see this? Uh, can you see this, Ashley? Yep. You guys see how great Ashley is? She's amazing. <laughs> so here is the 
cry cord cartlets smiling at us, right, Ashley? You can see it's smiling, right? I'm going to turn you into a head and neck radiologist, okay? <laughs> so there's the cry cord cartilage. Here's the arytenoid cartilage. Here's the cry cord arytenoid joint. So the posterior commissure is located between both cricoarytenoid joints. That's the posterior commissure. So it's just mucosa overlying the uh, inner cortex of the cricoid cartilage. And this area anterior is going to be the anterior commissure. Right. All right. How do you determine the level of tracheal rings? If the tumor extends below, which place is best to see which rings are involved? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, again, something that uh, that we try to do every day, albeit it's kind of rare because most tumors that extend into the subglottic larynx don't extend all the way through the base of the cricoid cartilage. So what I end up doing is the I don't have an example of this, but there's a, there would be an axial image that will basically look at the the last remaining ring or the cartilage, the cartilaginous landmark. So let me see if I can show you this. Yeah. So basically, this is what the subglottis looks like, and this is the cartilaginous ring. Once I get to the base of this cartilaginous ring, there's going to be images where there's no cartilage at all. And then as I continue to go, the, uh, especially in older patients, this tracheal cartilage becomes ossified again. So in general, the tracheal rings are about 10 millimeters in height. So what I do is once I go through the base of that last cricoid cartilage, each ring is about 10 millimeters in height. So that's when I begin to count. So I just go uh, no cartilage, cartilage, no cartilage, cartilage. And then I can just now I, with multiplanar reconstructions, I can just um, use my reference lines to figure out, you know, where I am regarding the, the, the tracheal cartilages or the tracheal rings, I should say. What is the role of PET CT in small laryngeal tumors? Uh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> it's a fabulous question. Um, you know, it really depends on who you ask. I think in general, um, early laryngeal carcinomas probably do not need to undergo a PET CT. So from my own standpoint, I don't think you really need to perform PET CT to evaluate the primary site for early laryngeal cancers. But a lot of my referring physicians end up doing PET CTs to look for distant metastases. So I think that really varies with the practice. If you ask me, do you need to do a PET CT for early laryngeal carcinoma? My answer is, is no. Great. Do you ever image using constant phonation to keep the vocal cords separated? No, I don't. Simple answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Trying to find, oh, is there any demarcation line between the end of glottis and beginning of subglottis, or do we consider all sections below the level of cricoartenoid joint as subglottis? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's no real, it's a fabulous question. Keep them coming. Um, no, you really don't. I think, um, like, uh, there was one case that I showed, like this, this image right here. So here's the cricoid cartilage, here's the arytenoid cartilage. Basically, this cricoid cartilage is, if you will, still sort of smiling at us. So this is really just a few millimeters below this. This would be about as close as I could get. But essentially, when I look at the cricoarytenoid joint, and then I start looking below, and I completely lose the arytenoid cartilage, then I know I'm in the subglottis. And this really correlates with the anatomy, right? So if I see the cricoarytenoid joint here, if you look at the cricoid cartilage, this back portion is a little bit higher than the front portion. So once I get below the arytenoid, I may not see the complete circle, but I know that once I, uh, the arytenoid becomes absent, then I know I'm at the level of the subglottis. So that's kind of what I use to make that very subtle separation. Right. And since we are on vocal cords here, we got a couple questions regarding that. Can you comment on vocal cord fixation on imaging? Um, yeah. Um, so 
Number one, vocal cord fixation, really the definitive way, sorry about that, the definitive way to look at this is at endoscopy. So when you look down and you perform endoscopy, the surgeons always ask the patients to do vocal cord phonation. And specifically, this happened yesterday in clinic, they have them do make a high pitch. And when you do that, it kind of closes the vocal cord. So that results in the apposition of the cords. For vocal cord fixation, what ends up happening is that the true vocal cord becomes fixed to the midline. So I think I may have had one example. Um, let's see, I think it was under transclotic spread. Yeah, this vocal cord right, this vocal cord right here is a little bit more midline. Um, and so basically that cord just gets pushed to midline. The reason why I'm really comfortable saying that this was midline is that when I look to the false vocal cord and I see this tumor involved in the false cord, then I know that there's enough mass effect to push it midline. So in general, you know, something like this, this doesn't necessarily be the midline, it's just thickened. But what I would suggest you do is not comment on vocal cord fixation on CT scans. Vocal cord fixation is a dynamic movement, and that dynamic movement is easily seen at endoscopy. So don't spend your time talking about, if you will, fixation. But what you can do is comment on the tumor, the thickness of the cord, whether it's subglottic or whether it's transglottic. Those things cannot be seen oftentimes at endoscopy or clinical examination. But the fixation, you can suggest vocal cord fixation, but I really wouldn't put that uh, in, your, in your report unless you want to say something that says, these findings are suggestive of uh, a paralyzed or a fixed cord. But in general, that's secondary. What you should be commenting on is the thickness, whether there's a tumor and the superior, the inferior spread, and whether there's cartilage erosion. Those are the main things that I would focus on. I'm glad you're on this slide. Uh, regarding images on CT of vocal cords, they tend to be blurry. Any advice on how to get them a little crisper? Uh, are you talking about my pictures or the other ones? I think yeah, just in general, there's a question general, about yeah. images on CT being yeah, a little yeah. blurry. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I mean these are pretty crisp for me. Maybe uh, they may be crisper, but um, in general, um, um, there, there's a fine line that we run into. And so the more higher the dose that you give, you know, the more crispy your images are going to be, but you have to be cautious because I remember, I still remember the, I, just, I remember where I was the day when the, the ring-like alopecia was first reported in patients undergoing CT perfusion. And all of a sudden, everyone dropped their dose the next day. So there's a fine line between giving an optimal amount of radiation dose so you can see the image in the pertinent anatomy, you can always give more dose. But on the other hand, you don't want to overdose patients. So you want to make sure that your dose is uh, optimized. Number two, you want to make sure that the patients um, hold still. And number three, especially if you're using you know, a modern scanner, the scanners have different types of algorithms right now. You know, they have different algorithms for soft tissue algorithms and bone algorithms. And if you look at your parameters and you say, well, my MA is good, my KVP is good, the patient's held still, and I'm doing my slice thickness submillimeter, well, that tells me you may want to go to your scanner to see how your technologists are actually reconstructing in soft tissues, because it could be a fixable problem just by changing your the algorithms, your soft tissue algorithms on your scanner. All right. Um, can you can you talk about the pre epiglottic space? Yep, great question. I have a great slide for that one. So the pre epiglottic space is right here. Can you see my screen, Ashley? Yes. Yeah. So this is the epiglottis that's located here. And the fat that's anterior to the epiglottis, this is the pre-epiglottic fat, also known as the pre-epiglottic space. So there was a image that I showed of a patient. I think it was under the transglottic one. Yeah, it was right here. 
believe. Yeah. So here's an epiglottic carcinoma. It's anterior and midline. It's also involved in the right every epiglottic fold, but most of it's anterior and midline. And you can see how, you see the fat here on the left-hand side, see how the fat on the right is gone. So basically when you look axially, it's this fat that's anterior to the epiglottis. And if you see that, that upstages these lesions to a T3. So this is uh, the pre-epiglottic space or the pre-epiglottic fat. All right. Uh, sometimes post-radiation changes bluff for residual tumor. What do you do then? Yeah, bluff. Um, so that's sort of a talk into itself. You know, in the future, we could have a talk on, you know, post-treatment imaging. But um, the long and the short of it is, uh, let me see. So this is an example. This was a patient that was pre-treatment, and this is post-treatment. And the, the point why I wanted to bring this up is that this can, if you will, sometimes bluff a recurrent tumor because it kind of looks big and nasty. But what I look for is I look for um, symmetric thickening after radiation therapy. So notice how the submandibular glands have become atrophic. All of this epiglottis, this is the median glossoepiglottic fold. This is one vollecula. This is the other vollecula. Notice how the changes are all symmetric. Here's another example. This area right here, these area epiglottic folds are, this is normal. You can see this after radiation and chemotherapy. In this case, and this is a different talk, but this was an example of laryngeal or chondronecrosis because there's air into the soft tissues. But the point that I want to make is that what I look for is I look for symmetric thickening and low attenuation after radiation therapy. So I look for that symmetry. If I see something that after treatment ends up having a, uh, a, a an asymmetrical soft tissue mass, you know, like the, here's an example of a recurrence here, then I start thinking about recurrent disease. But in general, the changes after radiation therapy, you know, are symmetric. Thank you so much for that. We're going to do two more questions and then and wrap. Can you give a brief rundown of the different ENT laryngectomy types? So we know. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, sure. So there's, um, there's actually a whole bunch. Um, but let me try to, um, let me try to uh, consolidate for you. Okay. So this is an example of a patient in which the epiglottis, the area epiglottic folds in the false course were resected. So after surgery, all we see here is the true vocal cord. This is what's referred to as a supraglottic laryngectomy. A total laryngectomy is obviously when the whole larynx is resected. Now, this is the standard type of procedure if the tumor stops above the level of the true vocal cords. So when we talk about supraglottic laryngectomy, it's predominantly done for supraglottic cancers. Now, this is an example of a standard hemilaryngectomy. So in this case, what we see is that this, this type of surgery is predominantly performed for a patient that has a true vocal cord carcinoma. So what happens here is that in this particular case, there's a true vocal cord carcinoma, there was no transglottic spread. So the surgeon can make their cut. They can take, remove one vocal cord and they remove a part of the thyroid cartilage. And that way the patient can preserve part of their voice. So this is what's referred to as a hemilaryngectomy. And there's also types, as I kind of alluded to earlier, where you can have microdissections or microlaryngectomies. If you have early stage tumors involving the larynx, well, they can resect that using some type of laser. So in a way, those are kind of, you know, three or four different types of laryngectomies. I, I have a full lecture on different types of, of, of laryngectomies. Um, yes, but that would take another 30 minutes. <laughs> we'll have to schedule, schedule that for our next Zoom conference. <laughs> All right. Last question. What about paratum... How do you handle a paratumoral tumoral edema on, on CT that might look more like an advanced tumor? That's a great question. Um, so the, the bottom line is we really can't tell. You know, um, if, 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 if I see a tumor, and I want to see if I have an example of this, um, if I have a tumor um, 
for instance, if I see this tumor here extending to the anterior commissure and I look laterally and I see a little bit of thickening right here, you know, is that a tumor or is that edema? You know, I don't know for sure. What's more common is that um, the tumors involving the head and neck, um, and it's especially prevalent once we talk about tumors involving the tongue base and the tonsil and the, the, and the oral tongue cancers, they have a very robust peritumoral inflammation. So it's not edema, but it's peritumoral inflammation. And sometimes the pathologist, and especially when we were looking early years ago, when we were actually looking at our ability to detect cartilage invasion, some of the cartilages that were taken out had no evidence of tumor at all, and it was just peritumoral inflammation. So principle number one is that, yes, head and neck cancers are real. Number two, these head and neck cancers elicit a very robust peritumoral inflammatory response. Number three, it's almost impossible for us to distinguish between a very robust peritumoral response from the tumor itself. So that's why when you look at these sensitivities and specificities, there's not 100%. So when I uh, am going over, especially with MR imaging, because we're looking for replacement of the marrow fat, not necessarily the erosion of the cortex, but the replacement of the fat. And this is not only for cartilages, but for bone erosions, for oral tongue cancers, or for oral cavity cancers. I always say the marrow is replaced. I don't know whether it's definitely due to tumor or whether it's due to inflammation. If I know that the bone is eroded for sure, then I have a higher likelihood of saying that replacement is due to tumor. But if the cortex is intact and I do an MR and then I see replacement by this peritumoral inflammation, I just say that to our clinicians and I'll say, this is what it is. You have to decide internally whether or not you want to do a mandibulectomy or do you want to assume it's just due to inflammation and treat it with you know, radiation and chemo after the treatment? So uh, we can't tell 100%, but what I do try to do is when I review this with my referrings, I always give them the scenarios and let them make the decision based on the best uh, educated uh, information. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Mukherjee, for the amazing lecture and for answering all of those questions. There's still so many to get to. Um, I wish we had all the time in the world. Thank you so much. Great. And thanks, Ashley, for everything. Thanks for all of you all. We said still have over 250 people on the line. So appreciate you guys taking the time. And, and um, Medali, thanks for everything you guys do. Absolutely. Happy to, come, happy to come back in the future, too. Yes, definitely. Yes. And thank you everyone for participating with the amazing questions and, and chats. It's um, This is why we do these new conferences. And you will be able to access the recording of today's conference and all our previous new conferences by creating a free MRI online account. We will also be sending the replay of this out via email with the email that you registered for the Zoom. So look for that. Be sure to join us next week on Thursday, February 15th at 9 a.m. Eastern, where Dr. Alka Singhal will de deliver a lecture entitled Current Uses of Ultrasound Elastography. You can register for this free lecture at mrionline.com and follow us on social media for updates on future Noom conferences. Thanks again and have a great day.